welcome to the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. This podcast focuses on financial planning and investment topics. Our goal is to help you make better financial decisions. We are fierce advocates of fiduciary advice. What does fiduciary mean? It means that anyone who advises you should always put your needs first. We hope you get some value from this episode. Thanks for listening. Standard housekeeping, anything on the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast should not be considered individual financial planning or investment advice. For that, we recommend you consult your own properly registered and licensed professional. Welcome to episode 26. I'm Brian Beasley and with me is Dan Alberth. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Well, today we're going to cover it, the first of a three-part series on probably one of the better books I've read on finance and money in, in, in the last couple of years. We're covering a book called The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness by Morgan Housel. I hope I'm not you know, butchering his name too badly. Morgan Housel is a partner at the Collaborative Fund and a former columnist at The Motley Fool and The Wall Street Journal. He is a two-time winner of the Best in Business Award from the Society of American Business Editors and, and Writers, winner of the New York Times Sydney Award, and a two-time finalist for the Gerald Lieb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism. All I know is that I really thoroughly enjoyed this book, and it is so meaty and valuable that we needed to break this up into three different parts, and we, we, we hope we do it justice. So let's get right into it. The premise of this book is that doing well with money has little to do with how smart you are and a lot to do with how you behave. And behavior is hard to teach, even to really smart people. Knowing what to do tells you nothing about what happens in your head when you try to do it. I mean, this is, a, this is the crux of everything. You know, it, it seems to me that, I mean, how many times do we have a situation where we know what we're supposed to do, we know what the right thing is, and yet we don't do it. Whether it's eating right, exercising, treating people well, holding, biting your tongue. Um, and, but when it comes to the money thing, you and I see it all the time where people know what the right thing is. They know the mantra is buy low, sell high. They know they should save. They know they should invest for the future. And sometimes people just struggle with that. So this book dives into what's going on in your head. We're and, human. We're human. Uh, we, and we're emotional creatures. We've even seen it amongst the advisors. Yeah. You know, we're all susceptible to errors. And what what what's great about this is that you this shines a light on some of those things, so that if you're more aware of those, you can catch yourself and hopefully do a better job. But why why are why do people even seek to accumulate wealth? Why are they even trying to invest in the first place? And he he writes this in the book. Modern capitalism is a pro at two things, generating wealth and generating envy. Perhaps they go hand in hand. Wanting to surpass your peers can be the fuel of hard work. But life isn't any fun without a sense of enough. Happiness, as it said, is just results minus expectations. And that one hit me right between the eyes. Happiness is results minus expectations. And you can take carry that across any area of life. There was another thing though, and I, we, we thought about structuring this along that formula. If, if happiness is results minus expectations, obviously you want to maximize your results and minimize your expectations. One would think that would lead to more happiness, right? If your goal is to have more happiness. But later on in the book, he also mentions that a feeling of control is a major fact as well. So we want to maximize results. We want to minimize expectations and we want to increase the feelings of control we have over our lives. So maybe the formula is more like, you know, the result of results minus expectations times control or plus control or what have you, if you want to try to make a formula out of it to, to generate more happiness, who knows? But if we're trying to maximize results, minimize expectations, and increase our feelings of control, let's just start with places in the book where he talks about what, what I would deem ways to maximize results. In two parts, really. You need to participate in the markets as much as possible for as long as possible. 
And the flip side of the coin, you need to avoid financial ruin. So how do we participate in the markets as much as possible for as long as possible? And, you know, one of the simple answers and the most controllable in a lot of people's opinion is to just save and invest more money. If you're putting more money away, you'll have more money. And this is very, it sounds like Captain Obvious there, but and we'll chat about that a little bit later. But where the author goes is he, he focuses a little bit on compounding over time is one of those things. And he talks here, good investing isn't necessarily about earning the highest returns because the highest returns tend to be one-off hits that can't be repeated. It's about earning pretty good returns that you can stick with and which can be repeated for the longest period of time. That's when compounding runs wild. He also says, if you want to do better as an investor, the single most powerful thing you can do is increase your time horizon. And I got to say, out of all of our clients that we've worked with, this is true. The ones that are the wealthiest compared to their income that they earned are people who put more money away. They participated in stocks, in most cases, over very long periods of time. Many times they already had wealth when they met us and we say, where did it come from? And they just put money and they participated into the stock market over a very long period of time. And we're talking about 30, 40 years of time. In some cases, they've inherited stocks that their parents had bought decades prior to that. So you're talking in some cases of money that's been invested for 50 years or 60 years in some cases. And that really does add up over time. Now, you look at the stocks that they own and or the, the, the funds they own. In many cases, they might be ho-hum. Might be a way to look at them. Just kind of basic simple things. They're not lighting the world on fire with the, they're not the best performing stock in all history. They simply got good solid returns over a very long time. So there's a lot of truth with that. Looking back at the formula, happiness equals results minus expectations. Some of these folks who have had tremendous success, when you look at them, they, they're not dripping with wealth. They're very modest people and their expectations may be lower than other people who are looking to drive flashy cars and have the best clothes and the best houses and live in the appropriate zip codes. But some of these people who are wealthy and have made it big, they've their expectations are to live life, have control of their own lives, uh, and enjoy family and friends and travel when they want to. And when you look at them, it, it's just not readily apparent that they're wealthy and that they're in a great financial position. Yeah, exactly right. The other component of participating in the much markets as much as possible for as long as possible is sticking with it. If you're in and out and in and out and in and out, you're not participating as much as possible for as long as possible and compounding. It makes it harder for compounding to occur. And, you know, we, we talk all the time about you, you, you need to invest so you can sleep at night. You need to invest in a way that is aligned with your tolerance for risk. It's aligned with you as a person. It's aligned with your goals. That's the math. And we just talked about that in the previous few episodes on our, our series on risk. And if you haven't listened to those, we recommend you go back and read that. But you need to be able to stick with something. Otherwise, you're going to be tempted to buy high or sell low or do something that doesn't make sense for you in the long run. So you need to be able to stick with it. Um, but beyond that, there's some nuance to this. And, and, and Morgan dives into it in the book here. So we'll go back to the book here. He says, investors who love their technically imperfect strategies have an edge because they're more likely to stick to those strategies. So what he's going at here is that you need to believe in your strategy, be committed to your strategy. He even says you need to go so far as to love your investments or love your strategy is what I would consider because the investments themselves, at least the way we do things, is not the key. But it's the, you, need to, you need to really be love like things, understand it well enough, love it well enough that you're going to stick with the strategy. Back to the book here. 
if you view, quote, do what you love, end quote, as a guide to happier life, it sounds like an empty fortune cookie advice. If you view it as the thing providing the endurance necessary to put the quantifiable odds of success in your favor, you realize it should be the most important part of any financial strategy. He goes on later. Picking individual stocks is not rational for most investors. The odds are heavily against your success. But they're both reasonable in small amounts if they scratch an itch hard enough to leave the rest of your more diversified investments alone. And we see this too. Occasionally, we somebody has a core of their portfolio that makes sense for them, but there's an itch that needs to be scratched emotionally. And that creates imperfections if the in the portfolio. You know, from our nerd eyes, we look at engineering this optimal portfolio that matches someone's risk tolerance and their risk capacity and their goals and it's all finely tuned and then somebody says yeah but I really need a little bit of this or I really want to own some of this and it's on both ends we've seen it happen where we've got some people that they just need to have some money set aside in the bank in certificates of deposit in CDs and on the other side of the equation we have people that say you know I just want to own some of XYZ stock, I need to have some stock, or I just want to have a trading account off to the side that I can play with. And if that helps them stick with the core of their strategy, and they have enough to keep them entertained or entertain their emotional need, then maybe that increases the likelihood that they're going to stick with the strategy with the other 95% of their portfolio, if you will. So what we will often tell people is, hey, take a portion of what Morgan will call later in the book here, your margin of error. So let's say your your strategy implies that you are um, you are going to exceed your financial goals over your lifetime by say you know a certain amount of dollars. What you can do is you can carve off a piece of that excess, and then scratch that emotional need. Maybe you're investing for fun. Maybe you're having some doing some speculative investments. Maybe you just need to have some more security blanket investments. It doesn't matter which side of the of that coin you you fall on. Um, good advisors, a good strategy. You should you should always have your core intact, but scratch the itch with something small, maybe 5% of the portfolio perhaps or you do the math like we do and figure out what's really possible i was in an investment club about 20 years ago with my brothers and we put away you know 50 50 into the pot each every month and we would invest in stocks but we did it for fun and i did not risk any of my retirement money great example he also talks here in the book about how you know where returns come from and if you can think of a bell curve a bell, if you, if you don't know what a bell curve is, if you're hearing this audibly, it's hard to describe, but just look up bell curve and there's the most of things are around the average. Most outcomes are around the average, but you do have outliers. And if you look at a bell curve, they call them tails. There's a tail off to one side or the other. And they're very rare, but that's what they're called. So he has a chapter titled Tails you win. And what he's telling us here is that the things that happen on the tail end of things is where the returns come from. He even talks about you know, art. <laughs> you know, you think about how is it that these art dealers got a hold of all these, if there wasn't donated to them, how did they get a hold or find that, that fantastic artist or that entire portfolio of that artist's work that's now worth millions and millions of dollars? And the truth is, he says here in the book, the great art dealers operated like index funds. They bought everything they could, and they bought it in portfolios, not individual pieces they happened to like. And then they sat back and waited for a few winners to emerge. That's all that happened. Anything that is huge, profitable, famous, or influential is the result of a tail event, an outlying one, a one in a thousands or one in a millions event. And most of our attention goes to those things that are huge, profitable, famous, or influential. 
when most of what we pay attention to is the result of a tail, it's easy to underestimate how rare and powerful they are. Great example with the stock market. Since 1980, now this book was published in 2020. So it's a brand new book. So we're talking about a 40-year time frame here. Since 1980, 40% of all Russell 3000 stock components lost at least 70% of their value and never recovered over this period. Okay, so the Russell 3000 is 3000 stocks, arguably the largest 3000 tradable stocks in America. If you go back to 1980, that means 1200 of them, 40% of them declined by 70% or more and never came back. Back to the book. Effectively, all of the index's overall returns came from 7% of component companies that outperformed by at least two standard deviations. So stepping away here, a small minority of the stocks in there, maybe 210 stocks over the course of 40 years, and their stocks coming and going in and out of that index, made up for all those losers and still ended up with the, the returns that came from that. The Russell 3000 has increased more than 73 fold since 1980. That is a spectacular return. That is a success. 40% of the companies in the index were effectively failures, but 7% of the components that performed extremely well were more than enough to offset the duds. So Dan, you asked us to go back and calculate that math. We, we, if, what's 73 fold look like? And that's about 11 and percent or so annually, just 11 and percent per year. And, We've had, we've had years where, where clients increased by 11%, and the feedback we get in an annual review or a quarterly review with those people, we say, hey, you've earned 11.5%. And they go, it seems like we're not really getting anywhere. I tell you what, over time, 11.5% adds up. 73 times your money. Now, a lot of folks will say, yeah, hey, if 7% of those companies did all the returns, why don't you just own those? It's so obvious. Why wouldn't you just buy the winners? And number one, well, it's hard to pick them in advance because if, if you could just do it that, just think this through with me. For those of you who think, hey, all you got to do is own the winners, you got to understand something. They weren't winners when you had the opportunity to decide. They hadn't won yet. So, and, and then think this through. If it was that easy, then every stock picking professional money manager would have absolutely crushed the index that they follow or that they track with over the last 40 years. And that is absolutely not the case. If it was so easy, don't you think somebody might have figured that out by now? But the funny thing is I've actually had people say that kind of thing mm -hmm. on social media or online in, in, in investing discussion rooms. And, uh, you know, God bless them, but uh, that's not the way it works. I have an example about a mutual fund company back in the 90s. They're, they're, uh, we're tracking the S&P 500 index, and they were trying to get better returns than the S&P 500. And their strategy was just to take the top 350 of the 500 companies and throw away 150 of the duds. So they were owning the largest 350. They were handpicking 350 of the 500 okay. with hopes to outperform the S and P 500 and that fund over a 10 year period underperformed the index huh. substantially and it was an expensive fund. So not only did investors investing in that particular investment pay higher fees, they also got lower returns and it kind of goes to how it's tough to pick the winners. Well, and what a lot of folks do is say, hey, you know, uh, the trend is your friend until it's not. So just follow the trends, follow the trends, follow the trends, follow the trends. And I hear this incessantly, especially lately, uh, because of the last decade or so, that's worked very, very well for a long period of time with not a few hiccups, not a, you know, just a few hiccups along the way. And so it's easy to kind of fall into that. But j just understand something that if, if you're trying to pick a winner because it just did well in the last six months, last year, short bursts don't necessarily imply that that's going to continue. Um, you, you look at something that's gone parabolic already. The current catchphrase in some places is to the moon, <laughs> you know, and the thing of it is, if you study history, there's, there have been things that have gone vertical on their charts. Their prices have seemed to be going vertical. They don't just keep going vertical forever. You know, it's very rare. 
And there's just, you need to just realize history shows that valuation is a stronger factor than momentum over long for long-term investors. And we're not talking to traders here. We're talking to long-term pe people who are, are not spending every day looking at this, the trading screens. The second thing you need to do besides participate in the markets is, and this is where I think Morgan puts more time into the book, is that you need to avoid financial ruin. This from the book. There are many things never worth risking, no matter the potential gain. So what he's saying here is that, hey, there's some things out there that are priceless. So there's that component of it. It's not worth it. You know, what's your reputation work? What's your self-respect worth? What are your relationships with your family or people you care about worth? Uh, your self-respect, your health. Can you sacrifice that for money? You know, should you do that? That's That could ruin you even if you're not financially ruined. But Nassim, he says here, Nassim Taleb put it this way, having an edge and surviving are two different things. The first requires the second. You need to avoid ruin at all cost. If you're financially ruined, you're out of the game, right? So there's a there's there's this topic he talks about called luck and risk. This is something that people often forget. We're all hardwired as human beings to forget that we'll make mistakes. We forget that there's a, such a thing as luck. There's such a thing as risk out there. And the way I'd look at it is you need to understand that sometimes a good process can lose occasionally and sometimes a bad process can be rewarded. That's risk and luck. You could be doing everything right and still lose because that's the risks. And you could be doing everything wrong and still win sometimes because luck does happen. So with back to the book, say I buy a stock and five years later, it's gone nowhere. It's possible that I made a bad decision by buying it in the first place. It's also possible that I made a good decision and had an 80% chance of making money and I just happened to end up on the, un on the side of the unfortunate 20%. How do I know which is which? Did I make a mistake or did I just experience the reality of risk? The other comment that hit me right there as you're reading that is five years enough time to determine if you've been successful or not. And we have people that'll hire an advisor or buy an investment and they'll give it six months or a year. See how it goes. And you're hundred percent right. It, it, these things happen over long periods of time. You can't evaluate whether you're on the raw, the correct route to drive from Chicago to Florida by looking at a compass at any one point along the way, because roads wind and curve or someone who like where I live, you have to drive. If I'm going to fly to California, if I'm going to travel to California, the fastest way for me to get to California from where I live is to first drive the opposite direction for half an hour to get to the airport. Then I'm waiting in line. And it just seems like, why is this even happening to get on the airplane to get where I'm going? And that's still the fastest way for me to get to California. Again, back to what he said, the surest way to make sure you do a good job is to lengthen your time horizon. He also says here, you'll get closer to actionable takeaways by looking for broad patterns of success and failure. The more common the pattern, the more applicable it might be to your life. So what he's talking about here is just like what you just said, you need to look at these things over time. Even if a million people were lucky last week, that's not or last month or this past year. That's not an indication of a radical long-term shift in how the world works. You need to be looking over decades of data, hundreds of millions of outcomes. The more sample sets you have, the more applicable something might be over the long run, the more timeless things are. And the thing is like, yes, there is such a thing as innovation. There is such a thing as technology. But his point of the book is that human nature doesn't change. There were speculative bubbles in tulips hundreds of years ago, of all things. There were speculative bubbles in radio stock in the 1920s. Technology shifts, technology evolves. This isn't the first time we've seen 
you know, if this, if there's a speculative bubble going on where we, if you're listening to this right now and you see a speculative bubble in anything or some frenzy around anything, we've seen it in real estate. We saw it in dot com stocks. We saw it in quote the nifty 50 stocks in the 1960s. We've seen it in, in all kinds of things over time. Just understand that's more of a human nature thing. That's more timeless than you think. Back to the book. If you respect the power of luck and risk, you'll have a better chance of focusing on things you can actually control. You'll also have a better chance of finding the right role models. We'll talk more about this later. He talks about surprises in the book here. And when I think about it, if I'm going to have a surprise, what kind of surprise do you want to have? Do you want to have a happy surprise? Happy surprise. Or do you want to have an unpleasant surprise? I prefer pleasant surprises. And this goes a little bit to the expectation thing, but... What he's talking about here is just understand that surprises are common and you should plan for them. Right into the book. Here's a few lines. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. Everyone's life is a continuous chain of surprises. The most important economic events of the future, things that will move the needle the most, are things that history gives us little to no guide about. They will be unprecedented events. Their unprecedented nature means we won't be prepared for them, which is part of what makes them so impactful. The trick that often goes overlooked, even by the wealthiest, is realizing you don't need a specific reason to save. It's fine to save for a car or a home or for retirement, but it's equally important to save for things you can't possibly predict or even comprehend. In fact, the most important part of every plan is planning on your plan, not a going not going according to plan. That's gold. It really is. I mean, it, there are going I mean, you look back at anybody's life and ask them questions and there are things that happen they had no clue were, were going to happen. You need to plan for that and put that into your situation and into your portfolio. And so if as, as we finish up this part one of looking at this book, what are, what are the things we want to focus on in this beginning part? Number one, you want to set yourself up so that in any circumstance, you are more likely to stick with your plan and participate in the markets for a very, very long period of time. Ideally, for most people, you shouldn't be getting in and out, changing strategies all the time, changing advisors all the time. Just figure out something that works well for you that you can stick with and let compounding happen. The other thing to recognize is that returns are of the overall market come from a few participants that you can't predict in advance. So if you want to stack the odds in your favor, that you're going to be able to get that compounding over time. The best practice that we recommend is to broadly diversify across the board. That's a best practice that uh, is well published. <laughs> your odds of catching those big winners are high if you own lots of companies. And the best way to do that is to be broadly diversified. One of our guidelines is to focus on controllables and certainly one controllable that you can focus on is a system for investing. You yes. can't control the markets, but you have a system that you can control. Process, process, process. But at the same time, you need to avoid financial ruin. Understand, there is such a thing as luck and risk. So if you're, if you're using too short of a time horizon to evaluate something, whether you're evaluating an advisor, whether you're evaluating a investment strategy or an individual investment understand that there is such a thing as risk and luck and that a short time period is probably not the what you should look at to make that that determination of whether you had a good process or bad process what what i would recommend is study what makes up good processes and just do that and let the results take care of themselves over time rather than chasing what just happened in the last six months or the last year because you want something that's repeatable over time. You never know where you're starting, so just focus on process. And so we'll conclude part one. Part two will be in the next episode. Once again, thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. Please find us on social media. We are at Fierce Fiduciary. You can also Google Fierce Fiduciary Podcast and find us anywhere. Dan, you're at from Facebook. I'm on Facebook. At 
Dan Alberth. Dan dot Alberth, and I am at Brian C Beasley on most platforms. We also participate in some Facebook groups. If you're looking to have a deeper conversation there about various things, there's a group called Investing for Beginners. And then Dan and I host a group called Investing and Financial Planning that provides some educational and learning material. So once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.